a pleasant welcome once again to your joy learning channel this is the revision show my name is dennis amoba today we are here once again and whenever i'm here then it means we are going to study english as part of our revision to prepare ourselves to take the west african senior school certificate examination Today we are here to look at one of the important parts of the English paper which has to do with the multiple choice questions what we call the objective test which is paper 1 but as far as the paper 1 is concerned we also have different sections and about 30 questions of the 80 multiple choice questions are made up of literature questions or they are based on literature we know in our schools we are studying two books and five poems the books are the son of umbele and then kaya gel the son of umbele is drama and kaya gel is prose and then we have five poems which are all african poems so today we're going to look at these poems the five poems you do our best to you know tackle as many of them as we can as possible so that when we are in the exam hall we will not be found wanting we will be able to give a very good account of ourselves so without further ado as we have seen today we have english and the topic is poetry and as always when we meet like this we have objectives that we would like to achieve at the end of our lesson so at the end of our lesson we would like to determine the subject matter and theme or themes of each of the five poems they are set poems and we we know them we've been given books and i believe that our teachers have taken us through the poems if you have not got through them we are here today to try the best we can to help you prepare adequately for the exam so we will try to determine the subject matter and theme or themes of each of the set poems then we will also try to identify poetic devices since they are poems they are devices that have been used in putting the poems together so we will look at poetic devices and then we will try to answer a few multiple choice questions on each of the poems because that's what we will be doing we will be answering multiple choice questions when we get in there to take our exam what is our first poem we have our first poem from one of these uh, accomplished poets he's no more though but he is one of the greatest oh he's the greatest francophone poet and his name is Leopold Sedar Senghor anybody who's that literature to any level would have heard of his name when it comes to african poetry they formed a group called the negative negative writers they were particularly interested in africa and how we were beautiful people and we had our own culture and so the name of africa should evoke certain Uh, 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 emotions so one of his poems is what has been selected because he has made his name in the annals of literature in the history of literature lepo seda sengo has paid his dues the title of the poem we are looking at today is i will pronounce your name i will pronounce your name that's our first one and i want us to look at it the way it is So we have this as our poem the poem which has about 10 lines 10 lines yes so don't forget that it has 10 lines okay so shall we try and read it I will pronounce your name Nayet I will declaim you Nayet Nayet your name is mild like sycamore it is the fragrance in which the lemon grove sleeps nayet your name is the sugared clarity 
of blooming coffee trees. And it resembles the savannah that blossoms forth under the masculine ardor of the midday sun. Name of dew, fresher than shadows of tamarind. Fresher than the short dusk when the heat of the day is silenced. Nayet, that is the dry tornado, the hard clap of lightning. Nayet, iron of gold, coin of gold, shining coal. You, my knight, my son. I am your hero, and now I have become your sorcerer in order to pronounce your names. Princess of Elisa, banished from Futa on the fateful day. This is the poem. And one name that runs through, as we all can see, is God. You said it right, Nayet. That's the name. We have Nayet here. Nayet, at the beginning, I will pronounce your name, Nayet. Nayet. We have other words that have been used. The it here also refers to Nayet. says, your name, Nayet, your name is the sugared clarity of booming coffee trees. And it, the it refers to the name, resembles a savannah that blossoms forth under the masculine ardor of the midday sun. Name of dew, the name still refers to Nayet, but they say it is name of dew. And fresher, fresher than the shadows of tamarind, fresher than the short dusk when the heat of the day is silent. Nayet is here again. Nayet, Nayet. Wow. And then we get to know Nayet's name. She is the princess of Elisa. But the most unfortunate thing is. She is banished from Futa on the fateful day. Futa is a place in Guinea. And so there's a historical twist to this. What is our focus here in this book? A name is mentioned several times. And as I told you from the outset, this writer doesn't just write. He is someone who was born in Senegal. He schooled in France. He was born in 1906, okay, he did so well that he had to attend university in France. He gets to be with these French people and even according to the literature fights on the side of the French and he was even sent to Germany, the Nazis captured him. He had lived with the whites. And he even went to one of the finest universities in Paris. And he is saying, I will pronounce your name, Nayet. I will declaim you. Means that he is here to make somebody popular. The claim here is important. You have to look it up in the dictionary. But I will tell you here. When you declaim something, you say it aloud, you, you speak it loudly, or you recite it. You make it known in public. So that Nayet is someone that we must be interested in. But is he really talking about a lady? That is one of the critical things we must look at. As I said, he was a part of a group who were interested in glorifying where they came from that is Africa Africa and the African so everything he does is about Africa but he does it covered okay by using this Nayet here in this poem like a woman and when we look at it it says I will pronounce your name is ready to let people know this woman. Then say, I will declaim you. And then the name comes again, Nayet. And let's go on. Nayet is here. 
your name is mild like and as we would know in literature like is comparing the name to this and that simile right good like cinnamon maybe we know cinnamon it's some um, some spice very nice has some fragrance for, as condiment for our food and you take it to smile but it's spicy and then it says it is the fragrance the name not yet is the fragrance in which the lemon grove sleeps lemon grove sleeping okay so somebody lemon grove not a human being sleeping so this can be personification okay we have said that we're looking also at literary devices that is used but the comparison of the name your name is mild like cinnamon it is the fragrance the name K has fragrance in which the lemon grows sleeps then Nayet comes again Nayet your name is the sugared clarity the clarity that we have is sweet is clear clarity of blooming coffee trees coffee trees have come on where do we have them in the tropics don't forget then he said it resembles the savannah please where do we have them africa that blossoms forth under the masculine ardor of the midday sun where do we have this masculine midday sun good you said that africa okay so we do we see traces of africa in this poem name of dew fresher than shadows of tamarind tamarind is also another spice condiment that's also used for for cooking and it, but it says your name is dew those droplets that come in the morning so it's fresh but it says that's your name even though when you are under the shadows of tamarind you feel cool you feel refreshed your name is fresher than that not yet then he said fresher than the short dusk you know we work from dawn to dusk that is when the day is coming to an end that period between day and night dusk so dawn to dusk and somebody works very early in the morning and they close late in the night so dusk but it says your name is fresher than the shadow go and stand on the tree after you've walked in the sun for a long time you feel fresh but Nayet's name is name of dew cool fresher than shadows of tamarind fresher than the short dusk when the heat of the day is silenced everything has come to an end the heat or the sun has set right then Nayet is the dry tornado wow tornado there is no are uh, here tornado and we know tornado right hurricanes cyclones powerful wind and Nayet's name has this power and energy and say your name is the dry dry tornado power then the hard clap of lightning has high voltage your name is powerful so that line evokes some power what's that name Nayet then let's look at it Nayet coin of gold wow gold mineral royalty richness shining coal shining and coal we know coal is dark so what are we talking about and this coal is shining say you my knight my son that's some, some sort of irony there or oxymoron my, my knight my son there's a balance in this night person and then says i am your hero and now i have become your sorcerer sorcerer magician somebody who has insight you have to have some skill to be able to pronounce Nayet's name it says i am your hero and now i have become your sorcerer in order to pronounce your names not one 
So Nayet has several names. And one of which is what? Coin of gold, shining coal, night and sun. In order, then Nayet we get to know her as someone who is a princess. Princess of Elisa, banished from Futa on the fateful day. What's that fateful day? Does that ring a bell when we were captured, colonized? Okay. So when you say, I will pronounce your name, Nayet, I will declaim you, the person has written it down. Verse Nayet has been put here. As I am reading, as we are looking at it, you are also uh, getting a sense of this Nayet. What it means is that Nayet has been made to live forever. Nayet has been immortalized. And whenever we pick the poem, we're going to think about this Nayet. And as I told you, if you look at this blooming coffee trees, you have um, savanna, then you have masculine ardor of the midday sun, then you have, um, you have the tornado as the power, we have gold, we have shining coal, this gives us a sense, my night, my sun. Then what we are saying is that, Leposingo, from his ideology of the negritude, is talking about Africa. He is proclaiming, glorifying Africa. He is making Africa known, and he does this by using Nayet. And he is not afraid, he is not ashamed. He is particular about Africa. He has so much love for Africa. And that is why he uses all these comparisons. And he tries to let us know how beautiful Africa is. Even though people might think of the outside world who do not like it. will say we have you know, so much sun here. And it's described as masculine. It is under that. That the savannah blossoms. Beautiful place. And then the name Nayet is mild like the cinnamon. And then the name Nayet is the fragrance. Wherever Africa is mentioned, all of these images come. And we see he describes Africa, which is represented here metaphorically or symbolically by the name Nayet as name of dew and this dew is fresher than shadows of tamarind. So essentially this poem from the shining coal, my night, you see savannah, all of these give us a clue to what the poet or the poet persona is referring to as we also consider the background of the poet and what his ideology is. So let's not forget this. As I have said, this is one of the poems. I know your teachers have taken you through them, but don't forget that this is a poem that the writer is using to glorify Africa, to make Africa known, and he is just mentioning the name. He hasn't said much about Africa. He's just comparing a beautiful lady, but metaphorically that's Africa. And then he's just telling you what Africa is and how powerful it is by using the dry tornado here. And then the hard clap of lightning. Lightning comes with high voltage and can destroy a lot of things. That's how Africa is. The name Africa evokes sometimes fear in people. So, and it is described as coin of gold. Nayet is coin of gold, royalty, riches, mineral resources. The savannah shows the vegetation. The coffee also shows the vegetation, right? And then when you look at coffee and sugar, they give us, it appeals to the imagery that we get there. It's of taste, right? Good. So we see image, 
it ap appeals to our sense of taste okay and then this is some power that we have then the dew we have experience of that so we come to these words here that have been used those are the different names africa is given the coin of gold is the gold that our focus is on mineral and gold refers to royalty africa africans are royals and we should be proud of ourselves we should not be thinking outside of, of, of this country or of this continent so nayat here refers to Africa and then it is described as shining coal you know coal is dark but he says it's shining sometimes you say that black is bright right that's what he's saying so it also refers to some of the minerals here and then you are my night my son that we have beautiful seasons you know, we have the rainy season you have the hamilton and times that are mild that's how Africa is and then it says Africa is his Hero. He is a hero of Africa, and he's not ashamed to say that. And then he says he had to be a sorcerer, have some insight or <laughs> some wizardry to be able to. If you don't have insight, you might not see all of this. That's what he's saying. Those who have decided not to see it will not see it. But he is a hero, okay, of Africa. And then he has, be, has to become a sorcerer. He has to have insight to be able to see the different names that Africa has. And we see that Africa, Nayet here, is a princess. But, but been, has been banished from future on that fateful day. I hope that when we look at them, we will be able to answer a few questions on this. You answer two questions quickly, and then we move to the next one. Say, I will pronounce your name. And as we said, Nayet represents something. It represents Africa. Don't forget that, the African continent. And then, just the name is used to refer to other things. Okay, and then I will declaim you, speak theatrically about you, or rhetorically about you. That means he is writing and putting the name of Africa into literature. And any time we look at it we come back to our senses as a people that we should not think that something is better somewhere else than ours you say we should not think the grass is green at the other side for the grass is greener here so that's what you're saying he wants us to know what africa is and as a people we have to be proud of ourselves because we are like coin of gold we are shining coal and we have beautiful seasons that's what Africa is so let's try and see we saw some simile here now yet your name is like cinnamon okay and then it is fragrance the name is compared to this one so, so and then the lemon groove sleeps as simile sugared clarity now yet your name is that that's also metaphor right your name Nayet is the sugared clarity of booming coffee trees. The name is compared to the sugar clarity of booming coffee trees. And it resembles, the name resembles, this also another simile, it resembles, it looks like the savannah that blossoms. And fourth under the masculine order of the midday sun. Name of dew, that's another metaphor. The name is fresh. Nayet is dew, those droplets, fresh, and it's fresher than, that's another simile, fresher than, there's a comparison there, fresher than the short dusk, okay, and then Nayet, that is the dry tornado, that's also a metaphor, the power of the tornado is compared to that of Africa, Africa is powerful. And then the hard clapping of lightning qualifies the power of the tornado. Now yet, coin of gold, that's also a metaphor. Now it is compared to gold. Africa, now yet, the riches here. Okay, so when you say Africa, then you are talking about riches, minerals. 
shining cold, beautiful, glowing. And then my night, my day, as we said, shining cold, that is, that's, which is shining, can it be cold, dark? Seems to be an oxymoron, but it makes a lot of sense. As I said, black is bright. You, my night, my sun. There seems to be some contrast there, but that is what it is. That there's a balance in Africa. It's not cold all the time. We have rainy seasons, we have Hamilton, we have periods that we enjoy. And as I've said, you can wear one shirt throughout the year. You wouldn't have to change clothes. That's a beautiful place to be. Then say, I am your hero, and now I have become your sorcerer. Because Africa is so, you know, full that you need to be insightful, need to have some insight before you can get a sense of the beautiful things that are in Africa. So quickly, I want us to look at some questions on this. Because that's what we'll be doing. I know you have been taught. We are revising. So quickly, let's look at it. So answer the following questions in the poem. What is the major theme of the poem? Or the major theme of the poem is, let's look at it. We have some answers here. What are you saying? What's the major theme? I'm hopeful you said that. Good. The answer is C which is the glorification of Africa. The poet is glorifying Africa. And we see that in the words that are used. Okay. And then we go to our second one. Nayet is a dry tornado. The hard clap of lightning illustrates, what does it illustrate? I think this one should be illustrates. Nayet. That is a dry tornado that the hard clap of lightning illustrate. What does it illustrate? Let's see whether you get it right. What is it? Is it metaphor or simile or hyperbole? Good. You said that. There's a comparison of Nayet to the dry tornado. Okay. And this. So, Nayet, that is, you compare this. The power here is compared to, and Nayet, we have said what it means. Good. Then we have this one. The underlying expression in, it is the fragrance in which the lemon grove sleeps, is an example of, mm -hmm, the lemon grove sleeps. It's an example of great personification. Lemon grove sleeping. Okay, good. Let's look at our next question. The attitude of Africa, the attribute of Africa that the dry tornado, the hard clapping evokes. Okay, the attitude of Africa that the dry tornado, the hard clapping evokes is, what's that? Let's look at it. Is it distraction or death or power? Tornado. Good. Power. That's power. Means that in Africa there's power, there's energy. Shows the power, the strength of Africa. Let's look at the next one. The poem, I will pronounce your name, is E or an. What is it? Is it an octave? Is it a free verse? Is it a rhyming couplet? What is it? I hope that you have learned a free verse. That the, the lines are not even. Okay, there, there, are, there are no specific rhyme schemes, and it's, it's, it's just like you're talking, so it's a free verse, if we looked at it well. It's not an octave, an octave is a poem of eight lines, and rhyming couplet is just a poem that is two lines rhyming, okay, a pair of rhyme lines is the couplet, but this one is a free verse, okay, there are lines that 
connect with other lines, and that's what we call run on. So when you say a line and it has to continue in the next line, such that there are no pauses of full stop, then you say you have run on lines. And that is a characteristic of a free verse, and that's what the poem is written in. So it's a free verse. Don't forget that. Then so the persona encourages Africans to take pride. I think there should be two here. To take pride in their what's the persona saying? Is it their natural resources or the race and identity or their beautiful woman? Is it natural resources or race and identity or beautiful women? Good, you said that there are race and identity. We should be proud of who we are, uh, that we are powerful people, we are beautiful people, and we have wonderful things here. Let's look at this one. The technique used extensively by the persona is what, what technique does the persona use? Is it hyperbole or personification or apostrophe? When we say hyperbole, is there some exaggeration of a sort in the poem, if you have it in front of you? Are we seeing that throughout the poem, there's so much reference or comparison that is made where human beings or inanimate things are made human. Do we have personification where we have inanimate things given human qualities? I think so far I saw one. Lemon grove sleeps. Lemon grove sleeping. So what we have extensively is apostrophe and the naiet is not present but the poet persona is addressing the person. So in poetry when you are addressing an absent sort of entity or character, we call it apostrophe. Okay, so we hear Nayet, 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 but she doesn't speak back, she's not there. Or Africa that is being spoken about cannot speak back. Africa is not there. So what is used there is apostrophe, addressing an entity that is not present. Don't forget that. It is dominant. Nayet is throughout your name. I'll pronounce your name, Nayet. I'll declare you Nayet, 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 right? So that's apostrophe. Then probably this is our last question. The figure of speech used in the expression and it resembles the savannah. Savannah is in Africa, right? The plains that bloom. And it resembles the savannah. Resembles, you were told, us and like. So let's look at it. Is it personification or simile or hyperbole? Resembles. Now its name resembles Savannah. Good. That's simile. So these are a few questions that I wanted us to look at. I know once you have got a sense of the poem that Nayet is there. But Nayet has been used to symbolize the continent of Africa and the beautiful things that are in Africa the mineral resources, the power of Africa, and the fact that the poet has, the poet persona has done well to immortalize okay, Africa. So any time we read the poem, I'll pronounce your name, we quickly go back to thinking about Africa and the beautiful things in Africa. So I hope that we will not be found when this is what I said. So when you have Nayet, your name is this line, line two. Nayet, your name is mild like cinnamon, that's simile. It is the fragrance in which the lemon grows, that's personification. Nayet, your name is the sugared clarity of booming coffee trees, that is metaphor. Okay, and you see Nayet, 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 but she's not here, that's the apostrophe. And then when you see a line, like the first, the second line, continuing to the next line, okay, there's no full stop, that's what we call the run on. Even this, the, I think, one, two, three, four. The one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are ten. There's one here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. So from I think seven. Yes, from seven, seven, eight, nine. From six, six, seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine, ten. From seven, we see at this point this line. Now yet that is the dry tornado, the hard clap of lightning. It doesn't end there and it moves to Nayet coin of gold. Shining coal, you, my knight, my son. That's where it ends. So there's a run online here to join that. Don't forget that. And as I said, the names that have been given to Nayet, coin of gold, those are the other names. In literature, we call it epithet. Don't forget that too. If it came in the objectives, you should not be found wanting. So I like the nicknames or the new names that are given to someone. And Nayet has those names. She is coin of gold, shining coal. Those are the special names that have been given. And we know Nayet is a princess. So there's royalty. Africa is what we are talking about. Don't lose sight of that. It is Africa. But Africa is seen as feminine, right? Good. And the beautiful things in Africa, midday sun, savanna, blooming coffee, Okay, we have gold, we have shining coal, and then we have these wonderful things that make Africa beautiful. So, don't forget, once you hear, I'll pronounce your name, Seda Senghor, a negritude writer, they are in love with Africa, and they expect us to also be in love, because in the colony they grew, you had to be a human being by, as it were, living like somebody. In the French colony, it was assimilation, and you needed to imbibe or assimilate their ways of doing things before you be considered a proper human being, as it were. And he saw all of that and thought that, no, the African was also special. We had everything. We were doing our own things before they came, and it was important. We believed in who we were, we were and be, 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 became proud of who we were. And that is what we are saying today. It has not just been selected, it is meant to humanize us, to have confidence in ourselves, not to imitate and not be somebody else. Right? If you try to be someone else, you can never reach your potential. Be yourself. That's what he's saying. We are beautiful. And we have everything we need to grow. We go to our next poem quickly so that we see what the next one is. And as I said, the poems have been selected carefully for us. So we're going to look at all of them pretty shortly. The other poem is The Weaver Bird. The Weaver Bird. As, as I've said, we've, we have been given this book, and this is African poetry. So that when you get to the room, from question I think 71 to 80, it will be on poetry. And you have African poetry and non-African poetry. What we are looking at is the African poetry. From 71 to 80, you have two sets of questions. Yours... If you have studied that, and I know that's what we are studying in our schools, you have to answer the 71 to 80 on African poetry. Do not go to the other side if you have not studied it. But I know in Ghana, what we are studying, particularly in government schools, are the African poems. So when you go, don't get confused at all. Do not tell anybody that there are two sets of questions. I do not know what to answer. What we will be answering from 71 to 80 is what we're doing. Five poems, two questions on each. We do not know the two questions, so we try as much as possible to exhaust them. So the Weaver Bird, the Weaver Bird by Kofi Aounaoum, Professor of Blessed Memory. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he has written extensively. And one of his beautiful poems 
is what has been selected for our study. Professor Awuno is also a believer in the African and our, and our tradition. Okay, he wants us to, you know, keep on with our indigenous way of living, our indigenous way of, you know, worshipping our maker. Because we were here before people came, we were doing our own things. And he has this beautiful poem, The Weaver Bird. I'm sure we have seen birds fly to our homes trying to weave their nest. And that is what he has put here. And as I've told you, writers do not just write. They carefully select everywhere they use when they are writing. So the weaver bird has been carefully written. And you must look at what a weaver bird is. You are in your house, it comes to make it nest and sometimes as innocent as we are we, we like them to come and have their nest on our cheese maybe you have a mango tree or something in your house it makes the nest and then it lays eggs sometimes you're excited we want to look at the eggs oh yes about four eggs but we forget <laughs> that the eggs will be hatched, and one nest will increase to two or three nests, and then in no time <laughs> we get angry. When they come, we are excited, we look on innocently, we watch them build their nest. Right? And then in no time they have taken over our homes, our comfort. Okay, and then they start defecating there, you have to sweep under the tree all the time. Sometimes when you're even sitting under the tree, they defecate on you. So the weaver bird as a title has some connotations. So we're going to go into the poem and see what the good professor, late as it is, he's still talking to us here. What is he trying to let us know? Let's look at our poem. The first part that we can have here is quite has two parts but I, I, we couldn't have everything here so we will go to the other side it said the weaver bird built in our house in our house so he's speaking for a group of people our is critical here in our house the weaver bird and once it's the weaver bird the weaver bird doesn't live with us it comes from somewhere right do you get the drift the weaver bird it's not one of us and it came from somewhere so you can you can say the weaver bird is a stranger right okay a stranger from somewhere a weaver bird built in our house we have a house and laid its eggs on our only tree and as i said writers are particular i am looking at our hour here repetition some communality but the people have a tree and that is the only tree could be something that brings all of them together right our only tree and many times when you have a tree in our homes we we all sit under it when it is warm for comfort maybe so the only tree there could mean that it brings all of us together something that binds us a way of life or oh, okay and then says we did not want to send it away we he came home built on our only tree we did not want to send it away we watched there is some sort of inaction indifference we are watching we are looking on we watched the building of the nest okay it means that it didn't just take a day it was a process and we looked on and supervise the egg laying. As I said, you'll be looking at the egg, you go and count them. He supervised the egg laying. And the weaver returned. So after the egg laying, the weaver goes. And we see the word here the weaver returned. In the guise, the words are critical. The weaver bear has changed its nature. In the guise of the owner. Whoa. The weaver bird now wants to be the owner of our house in their guise. 
of the owner. And then he comes doing something. Preaching to us. Hmm? Preaching to us. And what is the riverbed preaching? Salvation. Do you have a sense of this? Is it? Good. Religion. Preaching. I do not think best preach. So can we think about something now? The weaver bed built in our house and laid its egg. Came one, laid eggs. We did not send it away. Can we connect? Good. I know you have got it. Somebody wants to take over our home. And that person who comes preaching to our salvation. We have done some history. The language I'm using comes from somewhere. So the weaver bird refers to someone who is a stranger and has come to live with us. We look on, we watch, and then the weaver bird lays eggs. We forget that these eggs will be hatched. The egg is hatched, the many, and then because they have taken over our tree, and the birds are making noise, when they return, in the guise of the owner, now they own the place. Then they decide to preach to us that we, who welcomed this beaver bird, and looked at the process of the building of the nest. Do not know how to live. We don't know what you're about. So the weaver bird comes and wants to tell us what will give us life. So there's some hint of religion there. And to us, that owned hmm, the owners who we who have welcomed you, you are now coming to preach to us. That's what the poet persona is saying. Let's look at this one. Then it says, they, that which they are preaching to us, they say it comes from the West. And don't forget this one, the West. The West. We have done a lot. So when we hear the West, we know what we are referring to. The West, whoever says the West, we know we are referring to Europe and the Americas. Okay? So they say it came from the West. Where the storms at sea had felled the gulls, the storms so at sea. The gulls, the seagulls are the loose beds. They had been felled. Means that there is some destruction there. And that which they are preaching to us comes from where there has been destruction. And the fishes dried their nets by lantern light. They don't even have light. So this gives us a clue that is indeed from the West Europe. But don't you see that the writer is being sarcastic here? There's some sort of sarcasm there. How can you dry your nets by lantern light? Lantern light. It means that the, 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 the place is cold. They don't have the sunlight that we have. Yet they have come to preach salvation to us then it says it's sermon it's sermon it came preaching so the sermon is the divination divination of ourselves divination of ourselves they are now going to prophesy to us tell us who we are having done all of this they had effects on us and it says and our new horizon your perception limits at its nest. We are not able to look beyond. They have had effect on us. Their standards have become our standards. And so what we see now is just what they preach to us. What they give us is what is true. It says in our new horizon, we have now forgotten our indigenous way of doing things. And what we can see limits at what they bring. 
at their nest, their home. And the nest here represents something because that becomes the building in which they live. So maybe here would have been the colonial administration, their officers or their institutions, what they say is what is the standard and that's the farthest we can go. We have forgotten what that all that we had or what we have. And that is what the poem is saying. A new horizon. Then but we cannot join the prayers. There's still some discrimination. The prayers and answers of the communicants. We still are not even seen as one of them. No matter what you do, if you try to imitate, take somebody's standards as your standard, you can never become that person. So why don't you go back to who you are? And then say, we look for new, new homes. So we are moving from one place to the other, new homes. We have forgotten about our home, our ways of doing things. Then new altars, the way we used to. We strive to rebuild the old shrines, our way of worship. This is our old religion. This is the indigenous religion. We have new altars, shrines, defiled by the weaver's excrement. The things that they have brought to us and has tainted our way of life. I hope you get the poem. It's a beautiful poem by welcoming people from the West, strangers, they come and they decide for you what it is that you must do. That is what the poem is about. We must read it that way, the effects of colonialism on us. And this is a post-colonial poem. It is written by the poet after colonialism. So we we, we see the effects that colonialism has had on us. The Weaver Bear refers to this colonial power that comes and we welcome them. We are hospitable to them. We, we even supervise. They come to our only tree and we supervise the laying of their eggs. And we watch the building and then we supervise the weaver. And then they go come to survey, they check that everything is okay, and then they return, saying that this place is for them, because the river bear comes and makes a lot of nets, lays eggs, and then the eggs hatch, there are a lot of birds, they also have to make their nests, their nests, and then they think the place is for them, and then they try to preach to us, salvation, those of us who own the house, who own this place. And then we see this. You say they say what it is that they are preaching to us is from the West. And as I've said, the West is Europe, America, right? And that's where we know Christianity came from. Sometimes of Christianity is not good, but it has always been said that. Christianity sort of fostered or promoted colonialism and it's a legacy that colonialism left us. So people always want to fight it and people have used it to commit all manner of atrocities to people. So that's what he is inspired by and he's written this poem for us. That we should be mindful of the things that we believe in and where things come from, people who do not even have what we have. We were here, we didn't call them. They came and we looked on and they decimated everything. They destroyed everything that we had. They deceived us. They come in the guise of their owner. There's some deception there. And then they preach to us. And then they have sermons. They are now coming to tell us who we are. Its sermon is the definition, divination of ourselves. And it has effect on us such that we are not able to look beyond what they say. And so he says, our new horizon limits its nest. 
limit at itness. So what we see now just ends at where they are. We can't see beyond them. We have thrown what we have away and we are basing our life on what it is that they have. But we cannot, even this, when we have gone there, we cannot join the prayers. As I said, there is discrimination and answers of the communicants. We look for new homes. We have been dispossessed of the things we have and we are moving from one place to the other. So that it shows dispossession, right? Looking for new homes. We have been displaced. And we should not forget these words. For new altars, our indigenous way of worshipping has been desecrated. I'm not saying going to perform rituals, but when we go to our churches and we are worshipping, some ways of doing things have changed. You have to sing in a certain way, otherwise you, 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 you are not you know, at that level. So <clears throat> we, we look for new homes every day, we are, we are searching, and then we, for new altars we strive to rebuild. The old shrines, the old places, defiled by the weavers' excrement, what they have put in us, they have defiled them. And this is a very powerful word, that which has come from them, come from them, is excrement here. And it has defiled the old shrines. And that's how I will know. You see, I know you, if you read his poem, The Cathedral, it has similar undertones. So, I know that when we have been asked questions on this, we should be able to answer them. All right? I have a few questions. Let's go there quickly. As I said. So, you answer the following questions. We say the weaver bird is a... What type of poem is it? I said it. Okay. Good. A post-colonial poem. A poem that has written to reflect who we have become after colonialism and how we are living our lives. So this poem speaks to us to mend our ways and not look on without doing anything. Otherwise we will be overtaken by events. Right? This is a post-colonial poem. And then the poem is about what? Was it about? Of course, as they came is colonialism. So colonialism has had what? Negative effects. It's not about imperialism or destruction of Africa. Of course, in it, but it's the negative effects of colonialism. Colonialism has had its devastating effects on us. Then we have, and the weaver bird returned in the guise of the owner, preaching to us, preaching to us that owned, I think there's that here, that owned the land, that owned the house. This expression shows the weaver bird's what? The weaver's, uh huh, we have looked at it, this line. And the weaver returned in the guise of the owner, preaching salvation to us that own the house. Shows the weaver's, is it kindness, hypocrisy, concern for its host? You said it right, hypocrisy, guys, right? We have given you a place to live and now you come and you act as though you are the owner. You are now going to tell us what will give us life. Well, means we had no life. Then, Lododo paved the way for the weaver to take control of the house. Which of these? The laziness of the African, lack of knowledge, the hospitality of the African, which of them? Good. The Africans were hospitable when the weaver bed or the colonial powers came. The colonialists came and we just were too hospitable. We welcomed them and before we would say anything, we say Jack, as they would say, 
they had already taken over. I think there's another sentence it says the weaver bird is seen by the persona as a if you look at the weaver bird based on this one, how will you describe? Is it someone or the colonialist, okay, the weaver bird or the weaver? Is it someone who has come to help us or has come to deceive us or destroy? So the persona sees the weaver bird as a deceiver. I think that doesn't come clearly, but it's there. It's the weaver. The weaver bird is seen <clears throat> as, as a deceiver, a destroyer, a traitor. Okay, because of how we have been displaced, dispossessed, and we, we, we don't know. We are now looking for new homes every day. We had our home and we are moving out of in this place now, going to where they came from. Good. So that's it. Let's go to the next one. We have question six. The nest in the poem means is it Africa? Is it home or colonial administration? It says our new horizon limits at its nest. Good. You said it right. Colonial administration. Okay. Colonial administration. That's what they have built. And we can't see beyond that. Even in our education, we have always had challenges. So we have this. The activities of the river bed took place in the guise of, let's look at this. What did they use? to cover our eyes as it were, as a camouflage. Good. Is the education in the poem? No. Trade, religion, preaching to us. Preaching to us. Salvation. Preaching salvation to us that owned the house. So they come in the guise of religion. Right. And then we have Eight, and supervise the lane, the egg lane, brings to the fore the dash of the Africans. This expression, and supervise the lane, the egg lane, and supervise the egg lane, brings to the fore dash of the Africans. What do we have there? Let's look at these options. Is it the innocence, the customs, and the nature? Supervised. Good, we watched, so that's the innocence of the African. They didn't assume anything. They had clear conscience that they had come to live with them. But no, they had their own hidden agenda, which was to dispossess us of the things we had. We have this. The sound device in the weaver bed built in our house built in a house, a bed built. What sound device is there? I don't know you know. Yes, alliteration. You have this sound, alliterating with the, the first initial consonants of bird and built. B, B, that's alliteration. Good. And I say building is a process. It shows the process. The weaver bed is a, what type of poem is this? What does the writer do? Is it a dramatic poem? Is it a meditative poem? Or is it a narrative poem? Of course, we hear narration. So it's a narrative, or it's not a dramatic poem. Neither is it a meditative poem. So these are the two poems that we have looked at thus far and I believe that you are going to answer questions please read it carefully as I've said this poem is a poem that shows the effects of colonialism on the part of Africans how Africans were colonized and how we were hospitable to our uh, visitors 
who came as weaver birds, as a good professor has named them, a weaver bird, the weaver bird. And they come to build, we welcome them, they lay eggs on our only tree, they come. And then we did not send them away because we are hospitable. We washed the building of the nest. That was some inaction. Should have thought through it and even supervised the egg laying. Then we forgot that the eggs were going to be hatched. And then the weaver returned in the guise of the owner. They come and they say they are the owners. Places for them because there are many. Then they come preaching. They have double standards. They are deceptive. And they are now coming to preach to us. That own the land. Okay. And then we have where the, it came from. says they say it came from the west. They say. So the river bed. The point persona even doesn't know where it came from. So they say. You know, some speculation. Doesn't believe it. Where the storms. There is distraction of a lot of things. And they are coming to us. They don't even have the natural resources. And then it's sermon. Is the definition. We have everything. And they, they, are, they, are, they are indulging in divination of ourselves. Who we are. They are telling us what will give us life. And because of this, there was effect, and these effects are negative, and it is seen in this line. And our new horizon limits, and it still does today. That's why the poem is relevant. We must look beyond that weaver bird's nest, the colonial legacies that they have left with us. We must look beyond it. And I guess we are making progress. We have to be very fast. But we cannot join the prayers. There's some sort of discrimination up until now. So why don't we be ourselves? And then because of that, we are moving from place to place. Look for new homes every day. For new altars we strive to build. And then that which we had have been defiled. We don't even believe in an indigenous way of doing things. People have got diseases that they shouldn't get because they want things that are not from here. So we have to be conscious of ourselves and do what is right. So that is what this poem is basically about. I think there is another poem which we will have to look at quickly. Then I know that you Join us when it is time, so you answer the question for the day for us. We have one other poem, which is also equally beautiful. And that poem, hmm, by David Rubadiri, uh, is a wonderful one. And it says, an African thunderstorm. An African thunderstorm. When there's a thunderstorm... Then we are talking about rain that comes with wind, powerful wind. But this one is an African thunderstorm. Thunderstorm comes and there's destruction. People lose their lives, they lose property. So this also tells you something. Okay, it's not just an African thunderstorm, they are symbols. They refer to something as I've told you. So when you are reading the poems, you have to read them this way. I know you have books and some commentaries have been given, so look at it. There's a literal meaning, the words are there. An is there, it's a determinant, African, an adjective to describe the third thunderstorm, which is a noun. But what does it mean? What is beneath? What is underneath it? Okay, and that's what we are looking at. An African thunderstorm. This is a part of the poem. It says, from the west, from the west, <laughs> we have heard some west somewhere. Let's look at this one too. From the west, clouds come hurrying with the wind, turning sharply here and there like a plague of locust. 
So we, once you see our like here, the clouds are here, and it's compared to a plague disease pandemic. Look, us, we know there are grasshoppers, okay, that come to destroy. So a plague will kill you, like <laughs> pandemic, and then look, us, do they come to destroy? So there's some distraction here from the clouds, and it's a thunderstorm. A thunderstorm is a natural phenomenon that we cannot stop. But from the west, of course, if you did some geography, you know that in Ghana and Africa we have south west monsoon winds that give us uh, rains. Okay, we know that. But once we see this from the west here, huh, and it's a thunderstorm, and I've told you there's something more to this west and the thunderstorm than a natural phenomena. So let's read it along that way. And there is these clouds, okay, come hurrying. And the clouds will stand for something. Once hurrying is here, somebody hurrying, coming and hurrying. Hurrying is for human beings, right? So the clouds have been personified. So there's some personification here. Okay. Personification. And they are hurrying. With the wind. And turning sharply here and there like. They are coming to destroy. Like a plague of locusts. And whirling. Whirling wind. When it's about raining sometimes. It's, like, it's as though two masses of air have come together. And they are turning. See that? Yes, that's the turning very fast. That's how the clouds have come. And they are whirling and they are like plague of locusts. Tossing up things. Distraction. On its tail. Another simile like the way it is done. Like a madman chasing nothing. So there is no order. The distraction is just there. Don't forget. From the west. Klaus. Some people. Clouds personified. So you see the Western influence here. Good. That's how we read it. Then these clouds are described as pregnant. Pregnant clouds. The clouds have been given the qualities of a human being. Okay, so the attributes of a human being has been sent or given to clouds. This is metaphor. Okay, more of metaphor. The clouds are pregnant. They are full of something. Pregnant, pregnant clouds ride stately. Whoa, the clouds are now riding. It means that they, they are like kings and queens on horses. They are coming stately like a king. What it means is that these clouds have power and authority, and they must be obeyed. They write stately on its back, gathering to perch. Why should you perch if you are riding stately on hills? Means they are not coming straightforwardly to us. They are daily dying, going to perch somewhere. You are riding stately. You have powers. Why don't you come and live with us? To perch on hills, like, there's another simile here, sinister, evil, right? Dark wings. So there's some evil here, these clouds. The, the wind whistles, so the wind whistling, that's personification. Wind has been given the qualities of human beings, and it's whistling. By, and trees bend. To let it pass. Think about these ones. We will be back shortly. And then we will continue.